Hello, hello, and welcome back to this latest video of... We are going to be going through one of the most famous ships in all of Star Trek history now in a moment. Before we do that, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. We are so close to 250,000 subscribers. You are amazing and awesome and we massively, massively appreciate your support. Thank you so much, everyone. Remember as well to give the original article that this video was based on a read. It was written by the astounding Paul Sutherland, who I fully believe will be running Utopia Planitia shipyards given half a chance. Now, as you've probably guessed from the thumbnail, we're gonna be going through the Klingon Bird of Prey, which is probably the most famous alien ship of them all. This ship is almost as recognizable as the Klingons themselves, famously beginning life as a Romulan vessel before being retconned to being part of the Empire. This has gone through several different iterations and sizes. We will be going through the Burel, Cavort, and D12 class ships as well. Grab yourself a gallon or two of blood wine and let's get to it. Hey, je l'ouvre me. Cage. Jajvam. Welcome to 10 Secrets of the Klingon Bird of Prey. Number 10, Romulan Retcon. Now, as I just noted, the Klingon Bird of Prey was originally intended to be a motion picture era style redesign of the classic Romulan Bird of Prey from the original series. Initial drafts of the ship would refer to the ship as Romulan, and that's where the Bird of Prey title came from. However, as the scripting process went on, the Romulans were swapped out for Klingons and their proprietary bird of prey was swapped out to be a stolen one. Ultimately, in the version of the script that was filmed and released, the bird of prey was simply a Klingon bird of prey with no reference to the Romulan connection whatsoever. There was, however, an in-universe explanation. According to writer-producer Harv Bennett, I didn't change their ship because I remembered a piece of trivia that stated there was a mutual assistance military pact between the Klingons and the Romulans for an exchange of military equipment. Bennett's explanation would remain as part of Fanon for decades, and like the Romulan use of Klingon battlecruisers in the original series, it was simply a way of explaining it away. That is, until Star Trek Enterprise came along and showed the Klingons using 22nd century variations of the Bird of Prey, thus completely retconning that in-universe explanation. It was nice while it lasted, though. Number nine, wonderful muscles. While you can easily trace the configuration and inspiration for the Klingon Bird of Prey back to the original series episode, Balance of Terror, the filmmakers didn't rely solely on Wat Chang's original design. In a somewhat novel move for Star Trek films at the time, the art department itself was bypassed and Leonard Nimoy handed off design of the Klingon Bird of Prey to ILM, which was doing the effects for the film. During early discussions with Nimoy, ILM's Nilo Rodas, David Carson and Bill George were inspired by the director's imitation of a predatory bird, arms outstretched like wings. Nimoy's guidance also included the directive that the ship should possess an elongated neck, again a characteristic of an attacking bird, and one that would be incorporated in Klingon starship designs for decades to come. Further exploring various concepts for the ship, Nilo Rodas drew a vague impression of a muscled man and then based the bird of prey as this man flexing his muscles in a downward position. Model maker Bill George then designed the ship around that with the railed vents above the wings as the shoulders of this muscle man and the wings down in attack position like the arms being outstretched. There was even red piping added around the head of the bird of prey to simulate the chin guard on a football player's helmet. As instantly iconic as the ship would become, it started life with Leonard Nimoy pretending to be a bird and modeling it on a football player. Number eight, honorable movement. A first for the franchise, the Bird of Prey model featured mechanized wings that could be lowered and raised as per command. There were three different configurations displayed in the search for Spock. Horizontal for flight configuration, down for attack configuration, and then raised for landing configuration. Now, while all three were on show in the search for Spock, they would be used again over the course of the TOS movies, but they would become less and less frequent going into Next Generation and beyond. This is because the physical model itself began to break down and the mechanized components stopped working which is why, for the most part, you see Birds of Prey in the next generation permanently 
in a horizontal flight position. This would eventually change with the move to CGI in Deep Space Nine. Number seven, down periscope. Continuing on with the franchise's long-running effort to save money, the Klingon bridge from Star Trek The Search for Spock was actually a reuse of a set from another series, the name of which has unfortunately been lost to time. Now, it incorporated various elements that have been left over from the motion picture and the Wrath of Khan, and such futuristic elements as plastic sandwich boxes, I'm actually serious. But the main feature of Kruge's Bird of Prey is the monstrous looking dog that was sitting beside the captain's chair for the majority of the film. This was a practical model that was operated by Ken Ralston, who was the ILM VFX supervisor who hid under the floor and moved it with his arms. Bizarrely, the set was totally redesigned for Star Trek IV The Voyage Home and the very same ship, now dubbed the HMS Bounty, was used by the renegade crew of the USS Enterprise for their titular voyage home. More than the design used in Star Trek III, this version from Star Trek IV would effectively set the template for all Klingon ships to follow. Newcomer Mike Okuda also contributed to that design. In Star Trek V The Final Frontier, the set was more or less the same, although they added a periscope that could be lowered over the gunner's chair. Number six. Kalos take the wheel. Now, as stated, the bridge for Captain Kla's Bird of Prey in Star Trek V The Final Frontier was a new build, although based on the build from Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. It would be used almost wholesale again in Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country. It was given a bit of a different colour scheme to represent General Chang's Bird of Prey. Remaining largely unchanged, the green lighting scale depicted the ship while at battle stations, there was a console added behind the general's chair, and there was something else that was a first for this ship as well. A steering wheel. Described by director Nicholas Meyer as an enormous thing that was impossible to move, the Bird of Prey's steering wheel is barely visible in the finished film, but an unnamed Klingon officer can be seen operating the antiquated technology in the background of a couple of shots during the movie's climax. Sadly, while many aspects of both Kla's and Chang's Bird of Prey bridge were incorporated into future versions of the Klingon Bird of Prey as well, this steering wheel was gifted to Meyer when production wrapped on Star Trek VI, and it has since long ago disappeared. Number five. Everybody remember where we parked. Because of its relative small size, we'll get to it. The Klingon Bird of Prey turns up in various different locations in Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, including landing in Golden Gate Park, hovering and intimidating a Norwegian whaling ship, and of course crashing into San Francisco Bay. To achieve this last shot, a version of the Bird of Prey was built and crashed into a water tank, combined with footage of a miniature Golden Gate Bridge. However, the final section of the film required Kirk and crew to escape the sinking bird of prey into the bay, which required a full-scale section of the ship to be built. Obviously unable to actually film the scene in open ocean, the filmmakers instead constructed the bird of prey's nose section in Paramount Studios' disused water tank, at the time being used as a parking lot. As Mike Okuda describes the location, this parking lot at Paramount Pictures was known as B-Tank, with short walls on two sides, raised beams on the other two, and the blue sky backing behind, it could be flooded to simulate an open ocean. One of the very rare times that a full-scale section was built for Star Trek, and it was parked in Paramount Pictures' parking lot. Appropriate. Number four, size matters. Long before fans were left scratching their heads about the TARDIS-like interior of the Discovery A, people have been wondering what in the name of Grethor is up with the various sizes of Klingon Birds of Prey. There's been many in-depth articles, and YouTuber EC Henry has actually done a fantastic video breaking down just how exactly two humpback whales could fit inside a Klingon Bird of Prey. The Bird of Prey seems to fluctuate between 50 and 150 metres long in the voyage home itself, and then in several episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, for example, Reunion and The Defector, it could be up to 350 metres long. To clear this whole mess up, the writers of TNG and Deep Space Nine have referred to two types of bird of prey, the Burel and Cavort classes, and Star Trek Generations introduced the retired D12 type bird of prey, which also retroactively appeared in DS9's past prologue. What's the difference between these three styles? Well, the episodes and movies themselves, along with Michael and Denise Okuda's Star Trek Encyclopedia, 
don't really help matters. Initially telling us that the Burrell is the larger of the three variants, then saying it's the Cavort, Rick Sternbach's Star Trek Deep Space Nine technical manual muddies the waters even more by suggesting there's a 685 meter long jumbo bird of prey that's roughly the same size as a galaxy class starship. But sure, no, go on and tell me how Discovery is the one that ruined continuity. Number three, Klingon keepsakes. As we've previously mentioned in this Dolphin series, it's always loads of fun when Star Trek merch turns up on screen. Now, for example, there's the AMT model kit of the Enterprise that turned up on screen in Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country, and then there's Playmates Borg Cube, which turned up as definitely not a toy in the episode Dark Frontier of Star Trek Voyager. Now, we've got one more for you. Hallmark's Klingon Bird of Prey turned up in this DS9 Season 4 Klingon extravaganza, The Way of the Warrior. While the producers initially commissioned illustrator John Eves to create a batch of new Klingon starships for The Way of the Warrior, the massive scale of the episode's centerpiece battle sequence meant the budget was tight and existing models would have to suffice. To fill out the Klingon fleet, Deep Space Nine's in-house VFX crew brought the old Bird of Prey, Vorcha class attack cruiser, and Katinga class battlecruiser filming models out from storage and quickly recalled the all good things Nagvar model from a touring exhibition. Still, the sheer quantity of ships that were on show meant they had to reach out to other ways of getting them on screen, including model kits, and yes, Hallmark ornaments. In fact, quite a few of the birds of prey that are shown on screen in the way of the warrior are those exact same Christmas ornaments that could be hanging from your Christmas tree this Christmas. Number two, mm bop. Paul, some of these titles work lovely on the page, but then you don't have to say them. After the destruction of the USS Enterprise in Star Trek III The Search for Spock, the Bird of Prey became the main starship setting of Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. To quote producer Harv Bennett, They had a lot of fun designing that one, and I think the colour selection, a kind of serpentine kind of green, went on to help us. Not only there, but later. We utilised it in Star Trek IV because it's so dramatic a look. Now, the drama of the ship must have been contagious because it went on to appear in Star Trek V as Captain Kla's ship, Star Trek VI as General Chang's ship, and Star Trek Generations as the Juros sisters, RIP, ship as well. Despite these major motion picture appearances and the aforementioned Star Trek The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, Short Treks, Lower Decks and Star Trek Prodigy, the ship was actually slated for more appearances than even that. The scripts for the TNG episodes Aquil and The Chase and the DS9 episodes Dramatis Personae and Crossover all indicated the use of the Bird of Prey, though the ship was ultimately replaced with the Vortschacht class attack cruiser itself created for TNG to replace the Bird of Prey but only moderately successful. And to note, while General Chang's Bird of Prey was able to fire while cloaked in Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country, there was an additional prologue planned that would have seen the HMS Bounty being deconstructed and studied by Captain Montgomery Scott. Number one, Qualth. Now, roughly translated, Legacy. The legacy of the Klingon Bird of Prey extends well past the movies, the episodes, the toys, the hallmark ornaments, and goes into Star Trek design language to this day. Now, while Star Trek's producers commissioned Rick Sternbach to create a new Vorchak class attack cruiser to replace the Klingon Bird of Prey, the popularity of the ship ensured that it would continue to make appearances. In fact, it's one of Star Trek's longest lived ships. It was so popular, in fact, with executive producer Rick Berman that he would often encourage illustrators and designers to use elements of the Bird of Prey when he felt other designs weren't working, including in the film Star Trek Nemesis. Both the Valdor type warbird and the Riemann scimitar incorporate elements of the Bird of Prey, despite them having Romulan as opposed to Klingon design. A seeming anachronism, Star Trek Enterprise featured a new spin on the Klingon Bird of Prey, designed by John Eves after several other 22nd century Klingon vessels were created for the show, but failed to meet the producer's approval. Even Star Trek Discovery featured a bird of prey in its Klingon-centric first season, a ship that was heavily influenced by Gothic architecture and H.R. Giger's biomechanical style, but still clearly bearing all the hallmarks of that very first bird of prey. It has since appeared in Star Trek Prodigy, and of course in Star Trek Lower Decks, most notably in the episode Wei Douche, where a lot of the interior are recreated so faithfully the only thing we're still waiting to see in live action again is another one of those dogs 
Give us one of those monster dogs, you patoks. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so much, Paul Sullivan, for putting together an amazing article. Again, please don't forget to go and check that out. Everyone, remember, you can catch us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can catch myself at Sean Ferrick on Twitter as well and at Sean.Ferrick88 on Instagram. And you can catch our editor at Edit Chris Edit on Twitter. You are all amazing and wonderful. Thank you so much. We'll see you again soon. Our friends in Ukraine, stay strong. Our friends in Iran, we are so proud of you. Everyone, Live long and prosper. We'll see you soon.